Good morning, everyone. This is Julie McDonald with Microcom Technologies, and I'd like to thank all of you for attending today's webinar with MetaGeek. Today's host is Casey Cathy. He is their customer experience specialist, and he'll be presenting today. If anyone has any questions, please submit them in the question box, and Casey will answer them at the end of today's presentation. Casey, I'm finished for now. Please go ahead and Awesome. Alrighty, thanks, Julie. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, this webinar is going to showcase some of the uh, core products that MetaGeek has to offer. And uh, all of these are available at Microcom. On the agenda uh, today, uh, first, I'm going to introduce myself and talk a little bit about MetaGeek. And, uh, and then we're going to go over some Wi-Fi fundamentals, so some really important concepts uh, about Wi-Fi that will really help you understand our products a bit more. Um, and our products, of course, uh, we, we sell Insider, Channelizer, and the IPA software. And there's some hardware involved with that as well. Like Julie said, we'll go ahead and open up the full floor for questions uh, uh, later. Um, so my name is uh, Casey. I'm the CX specialist here at MetaGeek. Um, I have a, a couple certifications down there. Uh, these are put on by a company called CWNP. Um, certified Wireless Network Professionals, and uh, I highly recommend checking that uh, company out and uh, getting some certs for yourself. Really helps further your knowledge of Wi-Fi. Um, and uh, you can also find me on Twitter at Kathify. Um, there's a really uh, large community of experts on Twitter that can uh, really help you out with any questions that you have. So if you if you follow me, you'll actually see some of the people I follow. I recommend following. Um, those guys, is, is, uh, there's a lot of experts uh, uh, there, and it's a great resource. Um, uh, about MetaGeek, we are located in Boise, Idaho. Um, this is actually a, a, a picture from our office here. And uh, this is a few years old. It's uh, definitely uh, developed a lot more. It's a very uh, booming city, but uh, we still love it here. And uh, I'll go ahead and jump right into uh, um, some uh, Wi-Fi basics. So kind of the first thing to uh, uh, to understand about Wi-Fi, the most important concept, is that Wi-Fi is half duplex. And uh, uh, what does that mean exactly? Um, to kind of help you understand what that means, we kind of have to take a look at an Ethernet cable for a minute. Um, so an Ethernet cable, as you know, is uh, just a pair of copper, twisted copper cables here. And uh, what this does is this allows tra traffic to travel in two different directions at the same time. Um, and uh, and so we're all familiar with this. With an Ethernet cable, you can you know have a conversation with your your, your laptop and a and a, a router, and uh, traffic flows in directions at the same time. With Wi-Fi, however, it's more like a single lane highway, and traffic has to take turns uh, going in one direction at at the same time. Um, it's actually kind of fascinating. Wi-Fi works at all when you think about this. And so what this means is uh, uh, only one device can talk on a channel at the same time. And so say this is uh, this looks like a, some sort of tablet or uh, uh, Android phone here. So if this uh, if this Android is on the uh, um, network here and having a conversation with this access point, all these other devices, say laptops or you know any sort of other device on this network here, they have to wait their turn to talk until the conversation with this device is finished. Um, so again, Wi-Fi is half duplex. Only one device can talk on a channel at the same time. Really important to understand that. Um, there are two bands that the FCC uh, allows us to uh, uh, use Wi-Fi on, and that's the 2.4 gigahertz and the 5 gigahertz band. And I'll kind of go over some of the advantages of both of these. Um, um, so of course, with the 2.4, because it is a, uh, a longer wavelength here, um, actually, the, uh, the the distance between two wavelengths here is about five inches. Um, because of this, there's a there's a greater range, um, and so you're looking at about 300 feet or so indoors. Um, things like walls, it, it can penetrate walls a little bit easier. Um, because of this, pretty much everything works with 2.4 gigahertz. If you have a Wi-Fi device, it's always going to work in this band, um, and because of that, it's it's very congested with Wi-Fi. And, uh, and it's also congested with non-Wi-Fi as well. A lot of cordless phones, baby monitors, microwaves, things like that all just, just plague the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. It's really important to, to understand that. Um, because it's also so small, there's uh, these channels are only about 20 megahertz wide. Um, there's only three non-overlapping channels, and that's one, six, and 11. 
um, and we'll we'll kind of go over this more. But those are really the only three channels you should ever put a network on, and I'll go over that um, later. The five gigahertz band, on the other hand, the wavelength is a little shorter. We're looking at about um, 2.5 inches or so uh, 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 wavelength here, and um, and because of that, it has a lower indoor range. And so uh, you're looking at about 90 feet indoors. Things like walls and um, you know uh, ceilings, things like that, will attenuate the signal a lot more and stop the signal. Um, also, not every device will be five gigahertz compatible. Um, a lot of lower end laptops will kind of save some money by just including a 2.4 only. Um, and so you don't unlock the speeds and the uh, um, the freedom of, 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 of this entire five gigahertz spectrum here. There's 24 non-overlapping channels in the five gigahertz band. So a lot more room to breathe and a lot, a lot less non-Wi-Fi interference as well. Um, kind of some history of Wi-Fi that I think is really interesting. Um, you know, as you know, Wi-Fi uh, uh, started in 1997 with 802.11 Prime, and uh, we used this uh, uh, modulation scheme called direct sequence spread spectrum. And you don't have to remember that, but what's important to know about this is that on a spectrum analyzer, this actually kind of has a curve shape, kind of like this. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, that's pretty important. And then in 1999, we came out with 802.11a, and we changed that modulation scheme. It was a little more effective, a little more efficient. We call it orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. Again, you don't have to know that, but what's important is that it created a little bit more of a ziggurat or a haystack shape on a spectrum analyzer. And, uh, and so you will see these shapes pretty often if you use Metageek tools and you'll kind of know um, what data rates basically are being used because anything below 11 megabits per second um, is going to use this DSSS modulation scheme and uh, anything higher than that's going to use OFDM. So it's kind of important to know what those look like on a spectrum analyzer. Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, we use this OFDM. This was originally uh, made in the 5 gigahertz. We, we brought this same technology down to the 2.4 gigahertz with the invention of 802.11g in 2003 and 802.11n in 2009. I won't spend too much time on this, but it, it's definitely pretty interesting. Um, so again, uh, the only two or three non-overlapping channels in the 2.4 gigahertz uh, spectrum is, is channels 1, 6, and 11. Um, and, uh, and again, that's pretty important in, in, in Asia and other countries, um, they do open up channels 13. Um, so sometimes that can change depending on where you are. Um, but in the Americas, we, we really only want to use channels one, six and 11. And why is that exactly? Um, it's pretty important to, uh, understand the difference between co-channel interference and adjacent channel interference. Um, and so the, the kind of the example I like to use for co-channel interference is uh, is kind of imagine a, a dinner table, right, with your family. <clears throat> so at your uh, dinner table here, uh, you're all sharing the same channel or the same table in this example, and uh, you kind of have polite conversations, right? You you, you know, say your dad's talking, and you, and you kind of you stop and listen, you give him time to talk, and then once he's finished talking, you you can start talking or reply or or so on and so forth. It's very polite. Now, of course, the more family members you introduce the less time there is to talk, um, but uh, it's still a polite conversation, right? You can still have your conversation on this channel or at this table. Whereas adjacent channel interference, uh, the best example is you're still having a, a, a conversation with your family at a table. However, now you're at a restaurant and there's other families having conversations on their channels, right? Different channels over here. And so pretty soon um, the noise floor around you starts getting higher and higher and you have to start yelling uh, to, to have a conversation with your family on your channel, right? And so pretty soon you're yelling and uh, no one's being polite here and there's not enough time to talk. And so that's kind of the best example of adjacent channel interference. You really want to avoid overlapping channels um, and, and, and keep everyone on the same channel over here. And uh, this is what spectrum analysis is great for, which is, uh, uh, w you know, what Metageek really specializes in. Um, we can see co-channel interference. We can see this adjacent channel interference, but we can also see this non-Wi-Fi interference, right? Things like microwaves, cordless phones, things like that. Um, Wi-Fi devices do think that these non-Wi-Fi devices are Wi-Fi, and, uh, and so they will actually wait their turn to talk and let these devices um, 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 speak until they're done speaking, right? Because um, Wi-Fi devices are very polite. So with the Wi-Fi scanner, you know, all you can really see are networks. 
um, uh, like this and signal strengths and things like that. Um, you know, just whatever is being presented in the 802.11 beacon. However, when you pull in a spectrum analyzer, which uh, uh, MetaGeek sells what's called the YSPY DBX, uh, you can kind of start to see this invisible stuff going on, right? This, this radio frequency. And so the same exact picture, uh, you'd have no idea that there is this large interferer right here, some sort of spike of some sort um, operating here. Um, and so that's what's really important to kind of get a, a spectrum analyzer in there. Um, some quick notes on uh, Wi-Fi coverage. This tends to be some of our uh, most highly viewed content um, in terms of uh, signal strength. What we like to achieve here um, is negative 67 dBm. And so if you're setting up a network and you need to know what, you know, what RSSI or what signal strength uh, should I try and have at all areas that need Wi-Fi, we always shoot for negative 67 dBm. It seems to be pretty solid. You can, you know, if you have Google Hangouts or watching YouTube videos, it should work great. As soon as you start getting a little less than that, let's say negative 70, negative 80 dBm, you might start dropping some frames, some packets might start being dropped. Um, and, uh, and so, you, you don't really want to strive for those. Negative 67 dBm tends to be the uh, sweet spot that we like here at MetaGeek. And so with that, I'll go ahead and show you our Insider Office um, software here. Um, this is a, a basic Wi-Fi scanner. And then, of course, if you do have some uh, spectrum, um, you, you, I'll, I'll kind of show you how that overlays across it as well. But right now, it's just using my uh, Broadcom chipset and my wireless network adapter to just do some basic, uh, basic scanning here. And I really like this tool. It's really easy to use. Um, as you can see, right off the bat, it's just showing me all the neighbor, uh, neighboring networks here. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and switch to logical mode here, uh, which sorts by uh, SSID, groups everything by one network. And you can see I'm connected to my network here at home, uh, to my Kathy Fine network. You can see because I have a little chain link icon here. So I'm going to go ahead and select it. And uh, this will kind of start showing me the signal strength over time. So it's just looking at the signal strength of uh, I have a network here on channel 6 in the 2.4 gigahertz band, and I have a network here on channel 42 in the, uh, the 5 gigahertz band. And, uh, and if you select one or the other, it's actually pretty cool. It'll show you all the co-channel networks on it, which are in yellow, and then it shows you all the adjacent channel, which is in red. And so right now, I actually have a less than ideal deployment. As you can see, all these red networks are creating uh, adjacent channel interference with, uh, with my network. And uh, if you go to physical mode, um, you can actually, and, if you, and I'm going to go ahead and filter here. One really nice thing about insiders, you can just quickly filter um, down to your network just by, uh, you know, I just typed in Kathy here. And so if you select your network, it actually pulls out a recommendation for you. So indeed, it looked at all those uh, adjacent channels um, that were uh, conflicting with my network, and it is recommending channel 11. Um, so it takes the guesswork out of it. This tool is definitely meant for uh, uh, non-experts. Um, and so if you have a, a deployment that you're trying to set up Wi-Fi, uh, this tool is pretty great if you just want to take the guesswork out of it. It'll automatically give you uh, channel recommendations. Now, to unlock, unlock this uh, third tab over here, you actually have to plug in a Wi-Spy DBX, which, again, you can't see this, but I'm plugging in a Wi-Spy DBX. It's a spectrum analyzer um, that's USB-based. Um, of course, it sees that I now plugged that in, and then you'll start seeing some of this color get overlaid across the, uh, the spectrum here. And so now I can actually unlock this channels table, and, uh, and it's going to start calculating the actual utilization, right? So what's actually going on in this channel? You can only get so much with the Wi-Fi scanner, but as soon as you get that spectrum analyzed, you can actually start seeing um, kind of what's going on. Um, and so right off the bat, you can kind of see some activity over here in the 5 gigahertz band. Um, I'll get my pen annotation tool here, and uh, and you can kind of see that that my network is indeed making some noise over here in the five gigahertz. This is uh, what I'm currently connected to, um, and uh, some pretty neat things that I'll show you. And th these are all what you know get baked into the recommendation um, is uh, uh, you know just looking at one, six, and eleven here. It'll calculate for you, you know, the utilization on the channel. It'll show you how many, you know, on-channel networks there are, how many adjacent channel networks there are. Um, and, uh, and this can be pretty handy if you want to kind of see, like, okay, why is Insider Office recommending this channel? Um, and, of course, with the Wi-Fi plugged in, it's a lot more, um, a lot more efficient. Now, what if I was, um, 
you know, that this is just a snapshot tool. It's great for non, non-experts, but what if there was some sort of interference here that I couldn't quite identify and maybe it was intermittent. Um, and so this is where kind of the next tool really comes into play. Um, our channelizer software is the deep dive into spectrum analysis. Um, this software really uh, lets you locate sources of interference um, we, we have this uh, directional antenna that we uh, uh, um, provide with this and Microcom sells this as well. And uh, you can actually directionally locate sources of non-Wi-Fi interference, um, things like microwaves, cordless phones, things like that. Remember that these are all um, plaguing your network, right? Um, all your devices, since Wi-Fi is half duplex, uh, all these devices are waiting their turn to talk until this microwave is finished cooking a burrito, right? Um, so it's really important to be able to see this activity. Um, here's a, a screenshot of a baby monitor, which this is a, a extremely frustrating tool because it's uh, 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 this this baby monitors uh, they typically will will hop from channel to channel. So uh, uh, this is pretty cool. This is Channelizer. It's timestamp. So at about seven in the morning, um, this this uh, uh, for about four minutes, this baby monitor operated on channel five, and then it switched over to channel nine. And then finally it switched over to channel one. And so this would just wreak havoc on a, uh, a Wi-Fi uh, network administrator trying to set up the proper channel here. Um, this is what Bluetooth looks like on a spectrum analyzer. Um, this is, again, Bluetooth typically doesn't interfere with Wi-Fi, but if you have enough of it, it absolutely will. Um, kind of fun signature there. This is an old analog wireless video camera. Um, thankfully, these things aren't out in the wild too much anymore just because of, uh, of how much havoc they wreaked. <laughs> I mean, this is pretty crazy. It's about 20 megahertz wide right here and just uh, your network would just not have enough time to talk um, on that channel. And so what's neat about Channelizer, it's, uh, I, I compared a lot to a DVR. Uh, you can pause uh, uh, spectrum data, you can rewind your data, fast forward, um, things like that. It's a great tool to kind of leave um, sitting for a few hours, see if you can capture an event, and then you can come back and take a look at it. Um, and of course, once you find what you need to, you can uh, uh, build really nice reports, which have a lot of literature kind of built in, um, makes you look very professional. Um, and I'll, I'll show you that a little bit later as well. Um, finally, a, a really neat thing that I like to uh, uh, kind of show off is this uh, Cisco Clean Air accessory. So if you do deploy Cisco access points that have the Clean Air um, enabled features, um, you can actually, just with the IP address and the NSI key, you can uh, uh, view the spectrum from the viewpoint of that Cisco access point. And uh, this can be at a rem remote location. This can be across the country if you want. And uh, you can you can view that spectrum. So it's kind of one of the one of the few tools out there that lets you remotely view spectrum if you need to do some, um, you know, almost like a VPN type thing. Um, and uh, so yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, fire up Channelizer and kind of show you uh, what that looks like. I'm going to unplug my YSpy DBX real quick and show you what uh, Channelizer looks like without any uh, uh, spectrum. Um, there is a trial version that you can download if you just Google Channelizer trial. Uh, this is basically what will show up. Since there is no Spectrum uh, uh, YSpy DBX plugged in, um, you can just kind of poke around and view recordings that have already been made, things like that. But I'll go ahead and plug in the YSpy DBX and kind of show you what that looks like here. So once we have the Wi-Fi plugged in, it defaults at sweeping the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. And this look, probably looks familiar. This is a lot like Insider Office. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, go to the Wi-Fi menu here, and I'm going to dedicate it to sweeping dual band here. Um, so I wanted to sweep the 2.4 and the 5. So right now it's just showing me the 2.4. To switch over to the 5 gigahertz, I just click on this arrow in the top left. So now I'm looking at the 5 gigahertz band, and again, a lot like uh, a lot like Insider Office, you can filter pretty easy. Um, here's my network now, and you can place a little check mark by it and see where it's at in terms of signal strength. You can see the spectrum over time, um, very similar to Insider Office, but now it's just starting this recording over here. This we call this the waterfall view on the left hand side, and my time span set to two minutes. So once two minutes is up, I can start kind of navigating these uh, uh, sliders here and and uh, you know see more 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 spectrum instead of uh, watching this run and and you know typically at this point an engineer would walk around and and check signal strength and things like that make sure there's no sources of interference i'll go ahead and show you a a good example recording 
that we took a while back of a, of a Uniden phone. Um, I'm not sure if you guys remember those old cordless Uniden phones, but I know my family had one in the early 2000s. And um, these things were are, are pretty insane on how much uh, interference they give off here in the 2.4 gigahertz band. And so at this point, um, this was taken a while back. I think we had a couple networks set up here. Um, yeah, it looks like we had a network on channel five and, and a couple more over here. And, uh, and what's cool is on the left-hand side here, you can kind of see something coming here. This is that DVR feature that I was uh, telling you about. And so in this recording, we still haven't gotten to this point, but you can kind of see something's coming coming up here. And so uh, what's pretty neat with Channelize is you can actually just click and drag on this spectrum and just kind of select it and bam, there it is. You can see this interfere, this bright red. This means that more than 50% of the spectrum is being utilized. Um, uh, the blue is less than 10%, but you know that red is is obviously not not good here. Um, and uh, and uh, and so from this point, you can actually do quite a bit of things. One thing I really like about Channelize is this interferers tab. Um, so you can actually select an interfere if you're not sure what this is and drag it up in the spectrum and, and see if you can match it. So clearly it's not this 802.11b device, um, which which from earlier I told you was a DSS modulation. It's clearly not that. Um, it's clearly not OFDM here. It's clearly not Wi-Fi. This is a little too wide. Here's an AV transmitter signature. You can kind of pull up and, and say, you know, that's not quite right. There's some shoulders here that I just don't see. And so uh, sure enough, if you select the Uniden phone sample, you can kind of see that matches pretty well. Um, I believe that 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 is what this was, a, a Uniden phone of some sort. And so it kind of helps, uh, uh, this, this interferes tab just kind of helps to identify those types of things. And again, I kind of wanted to show you the report builder um, uh, feature, which is pretty nice. You just basically, um, to start a graph, basically, you know, let's just say um, I kind of want to add this uh, uh, density graph here. I want to show this uh, uh, signature, right? And so uh, uh, it'll just throw that signature right there, and it gives you some nice literature here. It explains the, you know, what what the colors mean for you, makes you look really professional. And if I wanted to uh, kind of throw in the networks table here and say, hey, look, you have a, a network on channel five here. Um, and this, uh, you know, this this device is clearly operating right on channel three and four, and it's it's you know you can literally see that it's operating in this uh, same channel here. Um, uh, and then you can print this re report out, save it as a PDF, send it over, you know, whatever you'd like, and uh, makes you look very, very professional. And again, um, I'll go ahead and not save that. And then again, this clean air accessory, I think, is a really, really cool feature. You can actually, uh, uh, with an IP, I don't have one set up at my house right now or anything like that, but IP address, NSI key, you can actually tap into a, uh, a Cisco Clean Air AP and and, uh, and check that out. And, uh, but... Kind of uh, uh, the the last tool I want to go over is uh, uh, what if uh, even with all this uh, we we call this layer one spectrum analysis right um, what if there's something else going on let's just say that uh, maybe your spectrum looked clean maybe it looked something like this and uh, something else was going on there that you, you you can't quite figure out maybe you have a a, a client device that just doesn't want to stay on the network or uh, uh, some sort of deeper issue here. Well, basically, since we started with the uh, uh, started with the uh, layer one there, um, uh, uh, you know, channelizer and insider office or that layer one, the physical layer spectrum analysis. Sometimes we need to jump to the next layer, uh, the packet layer. See the actual conversations happening between a client and an access point. Um, so while uh, spectrum analysis kind of shows you all the activity on a channel. The packet analysis, which is layer two in our IPA software, um, this kind of shows you the actual details, um, the actual conversation happening between a client and an access point. So again, it's very important to remember that Wi-Fi is half duplex and only one device can talk on a channel at a time. And uh, and uh, and too many devices, kind of like I was saying with the dinner table example, can limit your airtime or the, the ability to talk. Um, and this is really important to think about with uh, 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 data rates. And so um, if you have a, uh, 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 let's just say you have a, a phone on the uh, edge of a network, right? Maybe it's across the street and uh, someone's still connected to your network and they're trying to stream YouTube or something like that or check Facebook. Well, chances are they're gonna have to be resorted to a, a slow data rate, right? One megabit per second. Well, believe it or not, even if you have a device set, you know, right next to the network and it, it can achieve these high data rates, it still has to wait its turn to talk. And so do all these other devices until this device right here has finished its conversation with the access point, albeit at a very slow data rate. 
Um, a lot of times a good example that we like to use for this is this is kind of like uh, the slow kid in the back of the classroom, right? That raises his hands, talks very slowly, has a, a question that just kind of grinds the lecture to a halt. And meanwhile, all these students at the very front who are taking notes, you know, studiously, they kind of have to just wait until this conversation finishes with this client device over here. Um, that, that's kind of the best example. And this happens in Wi-Fi. And so it's really important um, uh, to kind of have a tool to visualize this type of information, right, to see these data rates. Um, IPA kind of uh, has uh, uh, different color schemes for each of these. Um, it'll show you the management frames in purple, control frames in orange, and data frames in blue. Uh, management frames are probably my, my, my personal favorite um, um, frames, um, particularly because uh, I think the beacons are fascinating. Beacons are um, basically uh, about 10 times a second or, uh, or, or so. Um, every single access point out there that is uh, 802.11 certified says, hey, on this network, I support these data rates, you can connect to me. Um, right now I have a, a network at home called Cathify, and like I said, 10 times a second, it's saying, I, I'm Casey's network, I'm here, I support these data rates, I support this encryption type, you can connect to me. It's actually pretty crazy how often that happens. Um, and uh, and uh, probes are kind of the uh, opposite. Probes come from your client device. Um, and so my iPhone, uh, when I leave my home uh, in the morning, uh, my iPhone will actually send a probe request to, to my previously associated networks. It'll say, hey, Kathy Fi, are you there? Um, can I connect to you? And, uh, and, uh, and so you, this is, it's actually pretty interesting. This is a lot of, kind of one of the main reasons why people suggest turning off your uh, Wi-Fi on your devices because they're constantly sending out these probe requests. And then of course, uh, uh, some access points will send a probe response and, uh, and say, yes, you can connect to me, I'm here, I'm here for you. And then they will go ahead and authenticate and then the client device will uh, associate to the network. So these management frames are a lot of fun. You can glean a lot of information from beacons um, as well, which is what we do with uh, our insider office software and pretty much anything to get the RSSI and the SSID, things like that, you can glean a ton from, from beacons. Um, so those are probably my favorite. Control frames kind of help aid in the delivery of these frames. Um, and so uh, kind of the best way to think about control frames are a lot like a, a walkie-talkie speak, right? So you, the, the ACK just stands for acknowledgement. So it's kind of like saying over, right? Um, are you there? Over. Um, so they know that you're finished and you say, roger that, right? Um, you know, um, I, I acknowledge that. I acknowledge that you sent something um, just because uh, uh, Wi-Fi devices are a lot like walkie-talkie devices. Only one can talk at the same time. And, uh, and uh, block acknowledgement basically was, uh, I think this was 802.11n. Uh, this was uh, uh, created to uh, allow more data frames to go through. So instead of uh, um, uh, data acknowledgement, data acknowledgement, uh, it goes data block acknowledgement. So it's data, 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 data and then acknowledgement, right? A little bit more data can come through with these uh, uh, control frames. And then of course, RTS, CTS, this is just request to send and clear to send. So um, again, a lot like uh, uh, walkie-talkie speak here, just making sure that the wireless uh, uh, medium is, is uh, uh, being delivered correctly here. And then of course, uh, data frames are the only non-Wi-Fi um, uh, frames here. These, these are the ones that actually go all the way out to Google, for instance, if you're watching a YouTube video. Um, this is your actual data, right? QoS data just means quality of service. Things like uh, voice is gonna be a little bit weighted heavier. It's gonna have more priority. I'll explain kind of how um, that works in a, in a second. And then annual data is just a power save. Um, they didn't have anywhere to put it, so they, they call it a data frame, but it's not really quite a data frame. It's just kind of a power save. So this is the uh, airtime arbitration process, and I won't get super detailed with this, but it is fascinating. In this example, um, the, these stations are just kind of like, we'll just pretend like these are client devices on a, on a channel, right, on a given channel. And in this example, station six just finished a conversation with uh, uh, station five. And, uh, and so this is kind of how um, each device decides to talk first, right? Because again, Wi-Fi is half duplex, um, only one, one device can talk on a channel at a time. So how do they decide which one gets to talk first? Long story short, uh, they basically roll the dice. Um, each client device, so let's just say station two and um, we'll say station three are trying to talk at the same time. And so they will literally roll this, uh, uh, not literally, but they'll roll a, a, in a metaphorical sense, roll the dice. And we'll say in this example, station one rolled a seven and uh, station three rolled a nine. And so they literally count here with these uh, spaces. They'll say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. He says, oh, that's, my, that's what I rolled. He sends a request to send to the access point. 
the sif, this is a short inner frame sequence. This is like a breath, right? So it, it kind of takes a breath. The access point says you're clear to send. There's another breath and then the data is transmitted. Meanwhile, all the, since this rolled a nine, this defers and backs off and it looks at its watch and it says, okay, I, I know I have two slots remaining. I'm gonna back off and let your conversation you know, occur here, but I know that I have two left. And so once this conversation's over, uh, this uh, rolls a new dice, it rolls a 10. This keeps its two slots from the nine that it rolled previously. So it counts one, two, and uh, it knows that it's turn. This station defers now. It knows that station two is is, is up next, and uh, and then the conversation again occurs here. The data, the short inner frame sequence, which is just a breath and then an acknowledgement. And this happens consistently, and this happens extremely fast. Within seconds, this happens like hundreds of times. Right? It's 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 pretty. When I learned this, I was pretty blown away actually that that Wi-Fi works at all. But that's essentially how uh, client devices. Um, talk. Now to visualize this, uh, in the past people had to use this uh, application called Wireshark, which is a great application if you're an engineer and you kind of know what you're doing, um, but it's really difficult to kind of visualize you know, how many of these clients are, are talking, um, what are the data rates that they're talking at, things like that, what type of frames are being passed back and forth. Um, it's just kind of like a list, right? It's like a, almost like a text document. Very hard to parse, very hard to understand what's going on. So IPA by MetaGeek, uh, we kind of help visualize this information, make it really easy using these uh, kind of pie charts. Um, and so uh, kind of how this works is we scan a channel, um, we do a packet capture on a channel. And uh, in this example, um, uh, basically your network is this very first sliver, this very first pie, right? So this network here uh, was a Bronco guest. We, were, uh, we use a lot of BSU examples here. And, uh, and so this was a, a, on the college university here. And the next layer out um, shows the actual access point um, transmitting, right? And so this access point took up about half of the airtime on this channel. Um, the rest of it over here were just other networks, other stuff that, you know, let's just say we wanna troubleshoot this, so we don't need to know about this, but we do know that it's taking up about half the airtime. We'll say this was channel one. The next layer over is the actual client device, right? So this is maybe this is maybe this is maybe a MacBook Pro or an iPhone or something like this. And here's another client device, and you can actually click on this and get the MAC address if you need to. And then finally, this this outermost layer shows the type of uh, packet being sent. So this is data. Remember, blue was data, uh, orange was control frames, purple is management frames. And so you get this very quick, uh, very quick visualization of what's going on on your network. And again, like I said, data frames are blue, management frames are purple, and it shows you the control frame. So you really get to understand what type of conversations are being uh, uh, passed back and forth. And then uh, additionally, um, of course, you wanna see more data frames, right? You kinda wanna see a, a healthy network will, will show a lot of data frames. You don't wanna see too much management overhead, and I'll show you some, some examples of that. Um, Right now, some of the sources IPA uses, uh, there's a lot of common Wi-Fi adapters that we uh, recently developed to work great for packet capture. Um, this is an old Linksys uh, 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 80211 AC compatible adapter that we used to supply. Now we supply an Edimax, which has three by three spatial streams, allows you to capture just a bit more traffic. Um, I need to update this slide. Um, you can also grab uh, packet captures from a, a, a MacBook Pro or MacBook Air. They have really great adapters in them, a 3x3 in the Pro and a 2x2 two two spatial stream in the MacBook Air. Um, of course, they have the latest and greatest. The, these are great packet capture adapters in there. And then there's other sources as well. A lot of enterprise grade access points will uh, spit out PCAPs for you that you can analyze in IPA as well. So I'll go ahead and fire up IPA and kind of show you um, kind of show you what it what it looks like and and, and uh, uh, give you a good example of some things it can do. So of course we have a trial version of this as well, and this is kind of what it would look like. Um, there's some files that you can kind of poke around and, and take a look at. Um, the first one I really want to show you is this uh, virtual SSIDs PCAP. This was sent in from a customer of ours, and uh, as soon as I opened it, I, I kind of uh, gasped a little bit because as you can see. Uh, this is all purple management frames right over here. If you if you can hover over it and see all these beacons managing and so uh, or being uh, uh, beaconed basically. And so what I kind of looked at at first is if you look over here on the left hand side, uh, you can see all of these SSIDs. You can see there's 
35 SSIDs and only 10 clients. And so this was a customer that thought it was a good idea to have you know, all these different networks for things. There's an onboarding network, a staff network, a student's network, a VR network. Um, these are all virtual SSIDs on the same access points, right? Um, a guest network, a bring your own device network, a second guest network for some reason, another VR network, right? And so what this does is this just introduces um, uh, management overhead, and you can immediately see that with uh, with IPA. Um, you can just see all these beacons. That's not a, a good, net, uh, a healthy network. And you can look at the airtime here and see almost a quarter of the airtime on this channel, which I think this was channel one, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, this was on channel one in the 2.4 gigahertz band. A quarter of channel one was completely consumed by nothing but management overhead, right? Remember how I told you these networks say, hey, I'm this network, I support these data rates, I support this encryption type, you can connect to me. It's doing that 10 times a second and you can see it happening right here. This is why we typically only recommend setting up no more than three virtual SSIDs on an access point. As soon as you start getting over that, you're just eating up all the available bandwidth that you could be using for actual data, right? Actual, you know, delivery of data frames like YouTube or Netflix or, or, or uh, you know, Google Hangouts, things like that. And so it's really important to uh, uh, keep that in mind. Um, one nice thing about IPA as well is you can actually click on these networks and dive into it even further. Let's say I wanted to troubleshoot this guest virtual SSID. And so I click on that and then I can actually, okay, which access point do I want to look at? Maybe this was a problematic access access point. And, uh, and then uh, uh, maybe this is kind of what I wanted to look at. What's cool is I can actually send this filtered data. So this is filtered essentially. And I can even filter it even more. Say I wanted to just look at the last uh, couple few seconds over here. And, uh, and I'll go back into it here in the last few seconds. You can actually go to file and send to Wireshark and then you actually can send it to Wireshark if you kind of know what you're doing. And, uh, and it's pre-filtered for you, which is really nice. So then you can kind of take a look at the uh, dive really you know, into the packet header just a little bit more um, if you know what you're doing. So a lot of people will use this tool for quick filtering as well. The other example I kind of wanted to show was this uh, uh, Netflix um, uh, PCAP that I took this at the uh, MediGeek office. So this one looks like a little bit more like a normal packet capture. I think this was in the five gigahertz band. Yeah, this was on channel 157. And uh, and here's the MediGeek SSID. Um, we had a, a YHE management, so some sort of, uh, this, is the comp this is the building that we uh, work in. They had a network over here. Um, looks like they're beaconing like crazy with with very little data <laughs> as well. But that's, you know, that's their problem. Let's just look at the MediGeek network here. So you can click on that. Um, right, right here, there was just one access point on 157. So you can actually um, really easily see that. Um, I had an iPhone and then an Apple TV, and you can kind of see this, and you can actually see the MAC address, which is really neat. And, and you can dive into this and see the, you know, the kind of the ratio of, uh, of uh, control frames versus data frames here. And what's really cool is you can actually go over here to this Analyze tab, and uh, and if you place a star next to your network, we give you these uh, uh, kind of uh, expert analysis for these tips. And so right here, we noticed that there was a high retransmit rate, a high retry rate. And so uh, one of my devices um, didn't get an acknowledgement from an access point. It didn't hear that ACK that I was telling you about. And so what did it do? It resent the data and it waits for that ACK to come from the access point. And so about 4.7% of, uh, of my packets were, were retransmitted. And it gives you the, the MAC address of the Apple device. So I can say, okay, well, I know this was my uh, iPhone device. What's going on here? Um, and so then we give these solutions, like uh, maybe it's a Wi-Fi chipset issue, and you can kind of uh, click on learn more here and expand upon it. And sometimes we just say, hey, maybe this was uh, uh, too much, you know, radio frequencies. Maybe it'd be worth uh, firing up a layer one tool like Channelizer and uh, diving in a little bit further and seeing if there's any spectrum issues. So it's really neat uh, uh, for these types of uh, uh, tips here. And uh, we're only working on adding more and more features to this. And again, this is the IPA software um, packet analysis layer two. And uh, this is offered by uh, uh, Microcom as well. Um, that pretty much sums it up. Uh, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to show you guys. Um, so I'll go ahead and send this back to Julie and open the floor up for any more questions you guys might have. Hey, thank you, Casey, very much for that wonderful presentation. And of course, I do have some questions for you. Uh, let's go ahead and get started with the first one. Uh, let's see here. Um, five gigahertz references ranges of 90 feet, but I do have some companies that advertise four to 600 feet per access point. Can you elaborate on this? Hmm. 
Four to 600 feet. I would be, um, so here's the thing, kind of when I said 90 feet, that's indoor range. Um, one thing to keep in mind is if you had no uh, buildings or no walls, let's just say you're out in the middle of nowhere, uh, theoretically that RF would travel as far as it can with before it hits something, right? And so I, I, I'm sure you could advertise as many feet, you know, as many feet as you want to, um, because you know, free. The, the only thing stopping RF without walls or anything like that is we call it free space path loss, and uh, and it will start to you know dive off a little bit just from you know just air molecules basically kind of attenuating the signal. Um, but even then, if you're out in the middle of an open field, theoretically five gigahertz, two point four gigahertz, it's all going to travel at about the same rate. Um, and so you, you probably could hit those, uh, those distances without any sort of walls, but keep in mind, realistically, if, if you have just a few walls, it's not going more than 90 feet, especially in the five gigahertz band. The 2.4 can pierce through walls a little bit more. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm curious, I, I'm curious to see, uh, what context they were, uh, giving that number because if, yeah, if it's outdoors, it's possible, but indoors, not really possible. Thank you, Casey. So you may have just answered the next question was, um, what is the difference between indoor and outdoor range? I think you just kind of uh, addressed that. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. When, when I say indoors, it's kind of just assuming there's a few walls, a few attenuators. Um, when I say outdoors, that's there's, you know, this is, you know, kind of a unlikely environment to be seen nowadays, especially within cities and things like that. But if you were in a rural environment, uh, outdoor range would be basically infinite. <laughs> um, got it, got and, and it, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so next question says here, what is the range of the Insider? Yeah, so Insider uses the chipset in your uh, uh, wireless network adapters. So usually those are built into your laptop. You can grab external adapters um, and keep in mind, it's just a receive only. So our tools don't uh, produce any RF or anything like that. It doesn't send anything, it just receives. And, um, and so typically speaking, um, you know, it really depends on the manufacturer of your chipset about how much we can receive or how far away uh, we can uh, identify a network. Um, you know, typically my chipset, the, this Broadcom, which is built into all MacBook Pros, I can see, net, I can see neighboring networks that are probably three, 400 feet away pretty easy. And again, it just depends how much is in between you and the network, right? Um, like I said, if you were out, outdoors and a network or you had an access point outdoors pointed right at your you know, laptop, you could, be, you, could you could see that network a mile away you know, if there wasn't a wall in between you. So um, yeah, we're insiders just receive only because we're just using the adapter in your uh, uh, wireless network adapter built into your laptop. So it really just depends what's in between you and the, the access point. Got it, thank you. So this next question is also regarding insider. Um, so it can identify the number of devices connected to the same channel, but can it determine the name of the devices? Yeah, so we don't do any, no, it, it, long story short, no, I, I, I don't believe it will. Basically, you would need a port scanner for that type of thing. And, and we try and, we, we don't really develop much port scanning tools, right? So a port scanner would take a look at an access point that you're connected to and it would sweep all the devices and get the names of the devices and things like that because it's associated to the network. We do a lot of passive stuff. So you don't actually have to be connected or associated to a network to use our tools. In fact, it's better not to um, for, for a bunch of different reasons, but um, so in that sense, we only can grab the MAC address. We can only grab what's in the probes, right? I was kind of showing you those probe uh, frames. Um, there's only so much information that Wi-Fi devices put in those probes. And uh, one of them isn't typically the, uh, the, 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 the device name. Those, that's usually not in the, the Wi-Fi probe that we can grab. Excellent, thank you. So next question mm -hmm. here is, does it work on all platforms uh, for example, Mac, Linux, Windows, et cetera. Yeah, Insider Office is uh, Mac and Windows compatible. Um, Channelizer and IPA are Windows only at this time. Great. Um, will there be a mobile version available? Yeah, that's a great question. We actually do plan on, uh, in April, we do plan to have a mobile version of, uh, uh, it's gonna be called Air Viewer, and it's gonna work on iOS as well as Android, and it's gonna be paired with a, a Wi-Fi Air. And uh, we're gonna basically uh, uh, um, 
uh, yeah, it's basically just going to be spectrum analysis and Wi-Fi scanning for mobile. So, yep, next month that will be out, but right now we don't have anything. Just uh, stay tuned, basically. Excellent. Thank you. Can you tell us the main difference between Insider and Insider Lite? Yeah. Um, so Insider, I showed you guys Insider Office today, um, which is uh, uh, um, kind of a uh, um, it's a, a paid tool. It has a lot more features. You can alias, whereas Insider Lite is a free tool. We kind of strip down a lot of features in it. Um, you can't alias networks. Um, I think we we limit kind of some of the information you see. Um, and so it's just Insider Lite is just a more stripped down version of Insider Office. Um, kind of just to encourage you, you know, if you if you do need those professional features, um, you know, and and even for instance, plugging a Y Spy in. Uh, you won't get Spectrum with Insider Lite, but you will get Spectrum with Insider Office. Um, so just kind of some of those higher level professional features um, uh, to encourage people to purchase that platform if they are a professional uh, Wi-Fi user or, or need to kind of use it in a professional sense, um, just to encourage them to purchase that. So Insider Lite is just a stripped down version of Insider Office. Excellent, thank you for that. Um, next question here, can you give us your thoughts or opinions about um, devices on the three, seven, or nine gigahertz band? Hmm, you know, honestly, I don't know a lot about any devices that work on the three, seven, or nine gigahertz band. Um, we really just focus on Wi Fi only here. Um, I know that the six gigahertz band is going to be opened up pretty soon here. That's the kind of the um, kind of the a uh, rumor going around that Wi-Fi will be opened up, but in terms of any of those those devices, you know, I think there's a couple drones that you know the controllers work in those bands. Um, I, I don't know of much that is that high. Usually, I see a lot of devices lower, like in the 900 megahertz, for instance. I see a lot of stuff there. A lot of customers requesting spectrum analyzers in that frequency, but uh, yeah, I don't know of a lot of stuff that are that goes higher than the five or six gigahertz band. Um, honestly, I've never, never have come across that before. But again, I, you know, we operate in Wi-Fi uh, frequency bands mostly here, so maybe that's 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 normal for me to have not seen those. Excellent, thank you, uh, thank you, Casey. Next mm -hmm. question here: um, Can you tell us about the 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 MetaGeek software that you guys provide? How does it differ from? Um, the free spectrum analysis tools built into the AirMax devices that Ubiquity provides. Oh yeah, okay. So a lot of um, a lot of access points do have spectrum analyzing capabilities, uh, very similar to even the Cisco Clean Air spectrum uh, analyzer that I was kind of talking about. Um, so yeah, Ubiquity probably has it. Uh, you know, Aruba, Ruckus. I think they all have spectrum analyzing capabilities. One thing to keep in mind, though, is that it's really important to have a third-party perspective of that because you're just getting the spectrum analysis from the access point. But that's not where the customers are connecting to the Wi-Fi, right? No, they're probably in an office or a kitchen or a bedroom or something that's far away from the access point. So you really need to take a look at the spectrum from the perspective of the customer connecting to the client. So it's great to have those types of spectrum analyzers, and they usually are high. Uh, uh, um, they're usually high quality spectrum analyzers as well. Unfortunately. The big downfall is it's not very important to, you know, if you have a access point on the ceiling, that's not the most important place to, to perform spectrum analysis. Um, you know, of course, it is important, but really the most important thing is what's the spectrum looking like down at the actual customer or the client? And that's where it is important to have a, a USB uh, or some sort of spectrum analyzer in your hands. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and typically those access points, those enterprise grade access points with spectrum sniffers, they, they usually are a little bit more on the higher end uh, of, of uh, scale in terms of purchasing, um, in terms of money and value. And so kind of the West by DBX and, and MetaGeek products kind of rest in that affordable space. Um, so you can have something in your hands at the you know, place that it's important to have a spectrum analyzer. And, uh, and so, yeah, that, that's what I would say is the difference is, um, yeah, the, those tools exist and they're great and should be used, um, but it's ultimately more important to have something from a third party perspective where the clients are um, actually using the Wi-Fi. Excellent, thank you so much, Casey. Uh, next question here. Um, 
Can you give us a, a, a clue as to what might what might be the next new devices coming out from MetaGeek? I think you touched on something, yep. and I was just wondering if you had any more you could tell us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so kind of, yeah, and we're pretty, uh, if, if, you know, if you follow at MetaGeek on Twitter or uh, uh, kind of go to the website, we've been pushing Wi-Spy Air. And, uh, and this is a, a mobile device and Microcom will be, uh, uh, will have access to this as well. Um, and uh, this is just a mobile spectrum analyzer and a Wi-Fi scanner. And it's gonna work for iPhone and Android. And kind of uh, the reason why this is kind of an important or uh, kind of a new tool in this space is that Apple and Google have uh, uh, kind of really restricted the APIs on their Wi-Fi scanning uh, abilities on their mobile devices. You really can't use those devices as Wi-Fi scanners. Um, they don't want you messing with that stuff. And so this kind of, uh, uh, you plug in this device and attach it to your iPhone with a cable and it kind of uh, circumvents that API. And so you're using a separate chipset and a separate spectrum analyzer. And so that you, you can use your phone now for Wi-Fi scanning and spectrum analysis. Um, and so that's really what we're pushing uh, pretty hard right now and, and uh, getting that out the door here in April. And that's going to be available at Microcom as well. Excellent. Can't wait to get that so that uh, <laughs> our team can, yeah, our team can know about it and move it along. Absolutely. Casey, thank you so much for answering all of those questions. And also, thank you to everyone for attending today. And if anyone has any further questions, please feel free to contact your sales rep or email us at sales at microcomtech.com. If you wish to view any of the products mentioned or shown here today, please visit us at www.microcom.us. And please remember this webinar presentation has been recorded and will be uploaded to our Microcom YouTube channel so you can view it again. So if you'd like to um, see uh, this presentation, you're welcome to do so on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Casey, thank you so much again for your time and your presentation today. We all very much appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Julie. Have a fantastic day. You too.